Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here with us from um, so many different places. Uh, it's really um, heartwarming to see like family, friends, collaborators, and uh, uh, some new um, new names um, uh, in the space. Uh, my name is Natasha Prilevich. Uh, I'm speaking from um, Užice, Serbia. I'm an artist and co-founder of Heckler, an artist-run collaborative platform that critically examines um, hospitality and conflict. Uh, we are also a transnational uh, collective of artists, uh, educators, and activists who are um, examining these topics through different uh, artistic, pedagogical, and organizing strategies. Um, this gathering is very special to us. Um, it is an amazing synchronicity. The two of our core members, um, amazing and inspiring uh, artists and women, uh, Jelena Prlevic and Farida Sahayafar, um, are uh, having um, two uh, simultaneous uh, um, solo exhibitions that are also surveys of their um, work in the past uh, several years, uh, up to a decade. Um, and um, this way, we are thinking of using this event to actually bridge both geography, since Jelena's exhibition is happening in her hometown in, in Serbia, where we are at right now, at the Reflector Gallery, um, and uh, Fire Day is having her survey exhibition um, at um, um, uh, Trotter and Scholler uh, that is presented by uh, Koda Lab. Um, so these two exhibitions, uh, Jelena's Too Much Remembering, Too Much Forgetting, Drawing as Metabolizing Memory, and uh, Farideh's You're in the War Zone um, are two really amazing surveys of, of work uh, that bring together and manifest uh, through different mediums um, in, its own, in their own right ideas around conflict, um, conflict resolution, um, also uh, healing, uh, as well as how we bring individual fears into collective space um, towards new radical imaginaries. Um, so, uh, we are really uh, happy as well that um, Francis Estrada, our friend and also art artist educator and part of Heckler, um, is going to moderate this um, conversation. Um, and um, we also invite you to see Francis's work as well. Um, and uh, through this process, also through part of this exhibition, but also with organizing this event, we are very honored to collaborate with uh, Claudia Frina Draber, uh, who is uh, with us as well is the founder of Coda Lab, a New York-based social practice residency dedicated to supporting artistic and professional growth of uh, mid-career artists. And um, I, at, at this point, I would love to invite Claudia to also say something about uh, Coda before we enter the conversation. Hello, everybody, and hello, Natasha. Um, you just stole my pitch. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Um, right, let me think. So I'm calling in from Brooklyn. I'm very grateful for Heckler for organizing this, for inviting uh, us to partner. Uh, it's a wonderful conversation that's going to happen. I'm sure we're all waiting for it. Just let me let me say two words before. Uh, so yeah, as Natasha said, we're a nomadic um, social practice residency for mid-career artists. So what we do at CODA is uh, survey exhibitions residencies and arts education. And as part of, so Farida is a current artist in residence, but also I had the honor to curate You Are in the War Zone, um, the exhibition that's currently at Trotter Scholler by invitation of Trotter Scholler. And that's another great partnership that, uh, that made this, um, this work happen uh, that I'm grateful for. And, um, I think that's that's mainly it. Let's uh, let's do it, Francis. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Claudia, and thank you, Natasha, for both of your introductions. And once again, I want to welcome everyone here to this space. We're very excited um, today. I'm just going to talk about the sequence of what we're going through. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to keep everyone muted for now. Uh, later on in the program, we're going to have a space uh, to open up uh, to questions in the in the Q and A. But what we're going to do is we're going to uh, keep this uh, somewhat casual and conversational between uh, the two artists and then with all of us as a group afterwards. We're going to start with artist presentations. Um, they're going to present their works uh, with some slides. And that's going to be followed by uh, some questions that I had um, uh, 
pre-designed uh, for the artists. And then after that is when I'm gonna invite everyone to share something uh, with us as well. And you know, just for the sake of continuity, if you have any questions throughout the program, just put them in the chat. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy them and then we'll address them afterwards during uh, the section. Um, and on that note, um, I think we are going to get started. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with the presentations, as I mentioned, and we're gonna start with Faraday. So Faraday is a multidisciplinary artist, educator, and a core member of Heckler. She's based in New York City, and her work investigates the politics of conflict, collective, collective history, and personal accounts. So on that note, I'm gonna pass it over to you, Faraday. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I'm just, um, for the sake of not multitasking, <laughs> I'm going to start sharing my screen. And um, you guys are seeing, right? Okay, great. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. This is amazing to see so many friends and collaborators and also new friends in the group. Um, thank you, Natasha, Heckler, and Koda for organizing, and thank you, Francis and Yelena, for being in a conversation with me today. Um, so I guess um, in, to start, um, just giving an overview of what my work is, or trying to give an overview of what the work is, I think um, my work is sort of a reaction to the media that I've been consuming here in the United States for the past 11 years, and maybe even longer, because um, I guess we can't really deny the presence of U.S. media and culture around the world, including Iran, the country that I was born and raised in. Um, for the sake of the presentation, I decided to focus on four projects that are currently at VU at Trader and Scholler. Um, the first project that I wanted to talk about is Topel that was made in 2015, um, which is basically a statue of a faceless monument at the moment of toppling, uh, made from bronze and concrete in collaboration with my sister, Sefida Sakhaifar and Mohammed Golabi. Um, toppling of, you know, when making the piece, um, I guess the main image that I was in my, in my mind from the media was the toppling of Saddam Hussein on April 9, 2003 by U.S. Marines in Ferdos Square. And um, the main question that I was asking myself was, um, who gets to do what for what purpose? Um, and I started looking, you know, as I was looking at the moments of the toppling of that monument, I was also looking at the topplings that were happening around the world and also like the tearing down the images and the posters in many different countries like um, R Romania, Ukraine, Iran, Venezuela, Libya and Egypt, you know, all around the world, because um, a few years prior to that, Arab Spring happened and there were like a series of uprisings. So it was like looking at the images of people and their reactions and the movements that were happening around the world. And there's a lot of, there's a lot happening at that moment, at the moment of the toppling, which is, you know, full of emotion, action, anger, pain, um, excitement. Um, there is, there's a momentum and, um, you know, and the, the question is, you know, what does it mean to take it away or intervene in that momentum? Um, and I'm leading, you know, that question to um, an interview that uh, Peter Moss had with Colonel Mac McCoy and the Marine commander on that moment at the scene about the toppling. And, you know, I'm quoting he, him um, that he said, what would that moment have been if we hadn't? kind of like intervene in it. It would have been some B-reel of Iraqis banging away um, on the, at, that, at this thing and eventually losing interest and going home. There was a momentum, there was a feeling, this atmosphere of liberation. Um, that was the attitude, keep the momentum going. So I guess there's a lot, you know, encapsulated just in this quote. And also thinking about the curation of the media to create an iconic moment, an iconic image, and deciding, you know, miles away from where that actual event is happening. On that day, you know, choosing that, um, um, uh, you know, moment as again, you know, the way that Peter Moss describes it, on that day, on that one monument was destroyed and another one was created. Um, and this is a quote, the new monument was a product of iconoclasm, the act of destroying the one broadcast live across the world. The toppling of the statue in Ferdosa Square was anointed in American media and by the American government as a virtual monument to the liberation of Iraq and the success of invasion, end of quote. Um, so I guess the monument, the erasure of that moment, the erasure of the presence of the people at that moment, and also the erasure of the face um, is a way for me to give imagination and allow the people to kind of like fill the blank and based on their collective memory. 
And I think, um, you know, looking at the piece in 2021 after the murdering of George Floyd and the protests and uprising that happened in the United States and around the world and the um, toppling of um, statues of uh, Confederacy also is another collective memory that can be superimposed on this monument at this time. Um, Another series that I wanted to share with you guys is Pending, which is a series of found images from major news agencies that um, are often accompanying the media's report on statistics and number of refugees. Um, so the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq by United States and also um, the civil war in Syria has led to mass displace displacements of refugees and the refugee crisis in the region. Um, as I'm looking at these images, um, I'm looking, um, you know, I'm zooming in and I'm looking at the bodies, I'm looking at the expressions, body language, and I'm thinking about translation, the translation of the media's language um, when talking about, you know, these narratives. And in my opinion, there is some, some kind of an absence of the narrative from um, people who are ca coming from these experiences. And it's not because, you know, they decided to be muted, they've they, to be mute, they've been muted selectively uh, because these narratives are not part of our conversation, the narrative of war, the narrative of displacement and the US foreign policy uh, from the perspective of those who are actually experiencing it. Um, so, you know, I'm, as, I'm, as I'm looking at these images, zooming in and erasing every individual's body and face, um, I'm thinking about the before and after of these images. And I'm thinking about how much is lost in these images that are already taken out of context. Uh, they're, they're actually capturing a fraction of a larger phenomenon, of a larger experience. And um, using these images with the droid language of media um, in reportings and accompanying numbers and statistics actually draws it out from the last drops of kinship. Um, so as I'm picking the tool, you know, the clonostam as a retouching tool in the technical sense, I'm thinking about, you know, um, that this translation, this medium as a form of, you know, thinking about the before and after, thinking about the trauma, thinking about the people, the experience that these people are um, experiencing through this journey, the, the violence that exists in there, the pain, the loss. And I'm thinking about the future. I'm thinking about the, 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 the language, the, the home, and I'm thinking about... Um, the selection, you know, what to keep and what to leave behind. And again, I'm, I'm hoping that by bringing that absence, kind of thinking about um, the, the, what is beyond these images and giving imagination to the audience to think about the before and after and actually this journey. Um, the other series that I like to share is You Are in the War Zone. It's a ongoing, it, it was a, it was a, you know, all these projects are kind of like long-term projects that happened through a year to, um, and they're like process based. So you are in the war zone is a series of um, gelatin silver prints on fiber paper. And they are street photographies that were taken by Sadra Shahab overexposed by tracings of um, documentation and images that I found online from Syria civil war. And I guess as I was working on the project, I'm interested in observing and understanding the relationship or our relationship to the images of war, documentation of war, the spectator and the passive distance that exists between the viewer and, and the image or the subject. Um, I am thinking about, and I'm also curious about social media, our phone devices, internet, our screens as, um, you know, the, the surface that we're experiencing these images. And I'm, you know, also interested in the fact that, you know, we're bombarded by information on a daily basis. We are opening our phone, we are reading, looking at images, scrolling down. And the moment that we feel uncomfortable um, with images that, you know, are not the norm, um, quote unquote, the norm, we turn off our phone or we open another browser or just, you know, close the browser or actually, you know, you can just move away from the screen to unsee the reality. Um, and it's about conscious and unconscious and um, kind of like our decision to consume what we prefer to consume. Um, so I'm thinking about, you know, um, I'm also thinking about the economy of war and our contribution to the economy of war and how much of that lives in our un unconscious. It, you know, over 50% of federal uh, discretionary funding is dedicated to U.S. military budget. Um, U.S. has been involved in more than almost 10 wars since 2000. And 
um, the war has, you know, war and intervention has short term, long term um, impact on people, their lives and, you know, their everyday being. So um, and so these are basically, you know, my way of understanding our relationship living in the Western context, um, in the leisure of Western life um, to the images of war and kind of like the overexposure is a way to bring that unconscious to the front and being selective with, um, you know, a narrative that is the current narrative of the time and bring it to the front to the everyday life, life of the um, every, everyday life of the New York City. I keep talking and I forget that I'm supposed to go <laughs> to the next slide. Um, so let's just look at this for a while. Um, and then the last piece that I like to share is um, when taking down a statue, a chain works better than a rope that I made recently in 2021. It's a large collage or maybe a digital painting. I don't know what it is. This is exactly that um, is a collection of found photographs that were taken at the moment of toppling of monuments all around the world. It's not just the United States, but I think. Um, what happened in the United States kind of gave me courage um, to do something with these images that's been sitting in my archive for the past, you know, six, seven years. Um, and I'm thinking about, you know, I'm thinking about what's happening at the at the bottom of the monument at the at the at, you know on the ground within the pedestal and i'm thinking about how the media captured these moments the, the use of the word um vandalism is an interesting term um, in my opinion thinking about the monuments as something stationary that is supposed to be stable not changed over time and it's a reflection of history and you know icons um, and what does it mean for people to intervene in these public monuments and intervene with graffitis or like markings or even toppling or damaging these pedestals and is it called intervention or is it called um, people's presence and marks in public space um, I'm also thinking about digital photography and the promise of photography and that it's a form of preserving history. And if digital photography is still, um, you know, um, uh, aligned with that promise, um, I guess, you know, this came to my mind after thinking this novel, um, um, Iraq Plus 100, which is a collection of shorter stories by Iraqi authors um, that they thought they imagine Iraq in 100 years. And I don't really remember the details, but in one of these shorter stories, um, the characters are thinking, are investigating the past and looking at the images that are left from 100 years ago. And they can't really look at the details and they can't find much in those images because even though we think that our images have high quality, um, 100 years from now, the images are so pixelated that you can't really define the details in those images. And um, you know, that leads me to the question of um, what, what happens to our history and our documentation of this time um, in this digital format and what is this pixelation, you know, how does it look like 100 years from now? Um, and if, you know, there is a question of who has access to high quality images and who has access to just like images that you can find online, you know, the ownership and the access to those information is another question that I'm asking, looking at working on this piece. Um, so, you know, having these questions in mind, I'm kind of like thinking of this piece as a collection of uh, our collective memory or maybe my generations of um, collective memory of these iconic moments. And I'm thinking of this piece as a way to um, preserve those moments um, um, as 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 information, as pixels. And intentionally I'm enlarging these low quality images that I'm finding online to um, think of a pixel as, um, as a form of a painting, you know, as, as pigments and um, using that um, kind of like texture that the pixel creates um, to, to experiment with that idea of the pixelation. I also included some of the, um, documentations, photographs of the exhibition at Trader and Scholler for, um, I guess, um, for the, since we are talking about the exhibition and the work in that context, I thought it would be cool to just include some of these shots as well. Um, also part of the exhibition was dedicated um, to Heckler bringing the collaboration that um, I had, some of the collaborations that I was involved in with Heckler on, um, in a format of, of the documentary film. 
that I guess we can talk more about during the um, conversation that we have. Sharing. All right, thank you for that, Farideh. And I, I see that we have uh, questions coming in. And like I said, we're going to save that for later. But yes, thank you for that presentation. And now we're going to move to our next artist, uh, Jana. Jana is a visual artist from uh, Serbia whose practice exists in the intersection between drawing, animation, and installation. A natural storyteller, she builds her narratives through layering of light, erasure, and the regenerative power of shadows. So Yana, passing it over to you. Oh, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Yeah, cool. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, with us. It's so wonderful to see some familiar faces and be introduced to like some new ones. And thank you, um, Heckler and Koda for organizing this talk and Francis for like wonderful um, introductions and Farida for this amazing presentation uh, that you shared with us. So um, my work uh, speaks to understanding of fear and healing process as integral to the resolution of conflict, whether internal or external. The series of works uh, that I presented in, as uh, Natasha said, Reflector Gallery in uh, Ujice is a sum of my uh, emotional responses to the past five years of uh, living outside of my home country. And it was quite insightful to have them premiered uh, in my hometown. So in the, from the context you know, where they came from um, and drawings uh, on display are some kind of uh, seeking uh, search for a dialogue with one's own fears. Identity questions, which include collectively imposed or inherited feelings of safety, guilt, duty, um, I make large scale graphite drawings, handmade animations, and drawings animated by projections. Erasing to remember is often a, a phrase, some kind of a voice that speaks to me while building these uh, graphite spaces on paper. And uh, these uh, places that I present are stories of no location, more imagined than actual realities. And they come from felt experiences of places like this drawing is it's a the title is Cathy's play and I'm so happy that she's here uh, with us now to listen to this. Um, Cathy's play is a charcoal and graphite drawing uh, I started making while living at Cathy's. Cathy's is a, a 73 old year old woman who shared her house in the woods during my last year of college and first wave of the pandemic. Uh, her house is a place where she grew up and came back to later on in life. One of the spaces I felt as containers of nurture, preservation, uh, and care. Each section uh, of the house and her backyard uh, speaks to um, lifetime histories of generations gone by and years of life committed, um, years of life committed to the community. Uh, second half of the drawing was made after my arriving to uh, New York, the place I found as something transitional, quite transitional in nature, what really amplified the sense of displacement as well as questions related to belonging. Um, and these two places kind of I was carrying this drawing from one place to another and they organically uh, blended and spoke to, to that transition. So using time and process as uh, modes of expression, uh, drawing reflected the complexity uh, of transitional states accompanied by sincere need for reconnection, which is invitably fleeting. Uh, so this is the... Um, this is the work in space um, and uh, the, the size of the work uh, kind of carries the observer from uh, one side to another. So it has this kind of cinematic uh, feeling to it. Uh, this picture uh, is uh, taken by my mother and uh, it shows my sister, my father and myself. I see there's an accumulation of time where looking towards the future is simultaneously um, 
means longing for the past. And this photograph served as an inspiration for many works to explore this compression of time and uh, bring my drawing to life with a hand-drawn animation. Um, this that happened in the, this piece. Um, Um, uh, sheltered um, is the name of this piece, and it's an installation of drawings uh, combined with the projected hand-drawn animated imagery. Uh, the animation describes the relationship between my sister and myself from different stages of our lives. And the figure of myself as a child presented uh, on the far left corner of the drawing um, of the drawing observes the sisters in this dismantled space, architectural space uh, that was drawn from the referential images of the spaces uh, where I lived while uh, in Serbia. Uh, the child figure transfers into a pigeon, a bird that always finds its way back if attached to a place of departure. The sense of attachment is tied to the elusiveness of memory, visually described in the drawing that functions as a background still shot. Um, as the bird flies from one panel to another, from light to darkness, uh, it activates other hand-drawn animations with its presence and ends its journey in the form of light, which reveals the interior of the abandoned house uh, my sister and I played in during our childhood days in Serbia. Uh, the support between sisters uh, allows the child to fly towards hidden damages and reveal much needed reparations. And combined, um, Combined with um, my, my drawings and animations, they uh, illuminate these intimate observations, grounding them in a present moment. Um, so uh, the usage of animation in my work is deeply inspired by the work of South African artist William Kentridge and Japanese animator Hayao Miyazaki. Both artists deal with factual and fixed aspects of history rendered through the negating lens of change and imagination. Uh, the polymsis technique of erasure makes the history of drawing visible. Uh, rare view mirrors bring again the idea of multiple perspectives, and these perspectives are mutually negating and describe this, um, describe contradictory feelings, opposing attitudes, something, something can, can, that can be described as wanting to emigrate uh, deciding to renovate the house at the same time. Um, so the weaving of these different perspectives, uh, past and present, uh, appear in the story Sisterhood. Uh, this story is written in collaboration with my sister and artist Natasha Prljevic, and it describes um, an, intimate, um, an intimate experience of early maturing seen from a child's perspective. At the time the story is written, Natasha was in the US while I was in Serbia, the narrative uh, centers around the abandoned house uh, where we used to play as kids. Our individual vo voices uh, are spoken as one uh, and uh, are spoken as one and they present this urge uh, and inability uh, to reconnect, um, to reconnect and create mutual memory. So um, growing up in Serbia, former Yugoslavia meant conflicted understanding of mutually shared realities. First tens or tens, 10 years of my life were shaped by dissolution of country, civil conflict, severe UN imposed sanctions, NATO bombing and silence about war crimes. This resulted in this early maturing guided by mistrust, undefined guilt and indoctrinated fear. What was known and reliable for me as a child uh, were play and conspiring times with my older sister. We would witness the injustice of patriarchal normative and imagine the world where history, histories would be more inclusive for other voices to echo. Um, throughout my uh, studio practice, uh, I was lucky to enter into collaboration with performers and puppeteers and create projects which made me perform on stage and experience stage lights as proclaimers of change in time as well in action. Uh, stepping on out of the light meant stepping out of time. While on stage, the light was time and catalyst for the change. 
uh, I was intrigued by the charged space left behind uh, once uh, performers leave the stage. And this, uh, this uh, thermal interaction of time, space, and memory in this theatrical experience encouraged me to continue exploring the questions of how we inherit places once they are abandoned. Uh, thinking about the absence of performance on stage translated into my two-dimensional work as an absence of uh, projected uh, hand-drawn imagery, the light reveals the animation and, and eventually becomes a proclaimer of uh, change. And this motion of light uh, imitates, um, illustrates breathing, uh, like a shelter where vulnerability shows up and allows healing to take place. Uh, this image uh, presents Kadinacha, a monument built to celebrate the lives of uh, workers' battalion who died in uh, anti-fascist fight against uh, uh, occupation. So from 1960 to 1980, uh, then President of Yugoslavia, Josip Broz Tito, commissioned more than 100 monuments to commemorate the victims of fascism. One of them found its place 14 kilometers, which is like 8.5 miles from uh, my hometown, Nuzice. These monuments were not intended to recall World War II or any sort of violence. Uh, the abstract forms are lacking symbolism of polit political ideology, war heroes, or religion, which inspires the visitor to think about a common future. So they are representation of what Bogdan Bogdan, which one of the designers of this type of monuments called indestructible uh, joy of life. So um, this next piece is uh, called uh, Neither Here Nor There. And it's an installation that is inspired by this kind of um, structures. And it shows up um, like conflicted state of mind. This dismantled architecture is that state of flux one experiences when confronted with changes and different truths, um, externally or internally. So there is no stability, only walls partially built. What is strong and stable is uh, projected light. Uh, so here you can see um, some other uh, place where the piece was installed. Um, uh, so uh, drone spaces, what is, what is strong and stable in these uh, drone spaces is uh, projected light shape, shaped by these constructions. So um, what is drawn is what the viewer is projecting onto uh, the drawing. So they are not fixed realities, but changing experiences and stillness and motion are a metaphor for connection between remembering, unremembering, and eventually healing through forgetting. Um, so here uh, you will see how the whole construction, like whole piece, uh, looked like in the space. So the piece itself was built the, in a way to kind of float in the space and um, speak to uh, to that kind of monumentality uh, and something that uh, it's not perceivable. So what I wanted to do, do as a, like a final thing for the presentation is also show like something that I'm currently working on uh, because the pieces that I showed in the show is the work that was done in the past uh, four or five years. But uh, what I focused on in these past uh, couple of months, it's been actually more than a half of a year now since I came back to Serbia last summer, is, um, is the work on the countryside. Uh, this is the place from where uh, the stories uh, kind of came from. And I started working with my family on restoration of old abandoned houses there. And this process uh, for me represents navigation of history and present reality, both of my family and local community. So here um, we together uh, transform physical space uh, with the idea to kind of open it uh, to open it to uh, cultivating hospitality, a uh, place of community care and uh, educational environment.
So that's where I will um, stop now. Right. <clears throat> Thank you, Elna, for, uh, for sharing that. Um, I think, you know, um, not many of us have seen both exhibitions. Um, I know I was fortunate enough to see uh, Father Des in the uh, Lower East Side, but yeah, no, it was great to see yours in context of uh, the space as well, to see the scale. I mean, just understanding when just seeing those images, but then seeing them in the gallery setting uh, gives you an idea of the immersive process of it. And then Farid, one thing I, I wanted to say too, being uh, in your space and especially looking at um, um, you are in the war zone, you know, you have the big window facing into the Lower East Side and you kind of see this parallel between your work and the community as well. So for this section, um, I wanted to see if we can um, have everyone get, gain some insight on not just uh, your process, but the subject matter you're working with. And in planning this, we had, uh, uh, the three of us had a conversation about the commonalities and parallels between both works. So the way we're gonna do this conversation is I'm gonna ask a question, but the question relates to both of you. And you can answer and uh, jump at any point or even uh, speak uh, to each other um, based on the subject. Uh, the first one I wanna start with is uh, specific to process and how do both of you use uh, source material and source material coming from either things that you see uh, online, things from mass media. Um, Farida, you talked about um, the reaction to the media that you've been consuming, not just from when you're here, but even uh, growing up. And Yana, your source, source material are also the space and also memory. So uh, I wanna ask you the question, like how do you um, interact with that source material? Do you have an idea? look for the source material or do you find the material and move forward? But if you can just um, uh, tell us about that process, that'd be great. Um, who wants to, you, Farida, do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, well, there are like, my in this, this particular uh, series of work, like especially with the animation, uh, it came from the story. So there is some kind of a story that I'm trying to unfold. And it was really interesting uh, to see uh, the works now in this space. And uh, it was, um, it, the, the show was installed in a way that the video was projected and the story was resonating throughout the whole space. So it kind of looked as, um, again, walking through these works after like some time that, since they were made, uh, it looked like they are pieces of a story. Like the each work is kind of guiding you deeper to the experiences that the story itself is trying to kind of um, explain. Uh, so it, it, in my, I, I kind of, in my process, uh, I'm taking fragments of, um, one thing that I'm working on and then through like imagery that is pulled from uh, the current space because time is passing, I am kind of bringing it into the work and then redoing it and finding connections with the older pieces. And yeah, so um, that's, that's kind of what I uh, learned about uh, my work while seeing it in this particular setup all together. Where I, in the past, I was thinking that uh, one piece uh, speaks for itself and is done in a particular way, but actually there is this kind of, um, uh, there is this thread of a story that is always present and from where something is constantly pulled off. Thank you for that. So in a way, it's almost like there's there's not a clear start, there's no clear end, everything is kind of threaded together. And yeah, everything is continuous and it forms um, e each other. So like thinking again in a, about something that I uh, will do in the, in the future is that like works are pieces of some story that it's kind of uh, main in the, in the room. And that's the way how we actually, like when you think about the memory and the, how we built a memory upon like different um, uh, perspectives and uh, experiences. So it kind of goes uh, with that. Right. Thank you. Uh, Faraday? Um, 
I don't, I mean, I don't really have a starting point and an ending point either, but it, um, a lot of times, you know, my work from, comes from observing and reading, and I'm mainly reading um, the media and the news, and not just one, one, one news agency, but I'm trying to kind of like plug myself into different news agencies to understand the, the narrative from different perspectives. Um, and also like looking at the images that are posted, I guess I spend a lot of times online collecting images of war, looking at them, archiving them, um, spending time with them, zooming in, zooming out, looking at the details, looking at the facial expressions, uh, body language and understanding, you know, what is that line that um, kind of like encourages the audience to move away from these imageries and I stop looking at the images of war and that's why erasure and censorship is embedded in my practice you know in the in the tracing over those images or um, in the way that I'm appropriating the language that is used in the in the media or in the in the text that is accompanying you know those those personal accounts um, for example, in the case of Halabja 1988, that, that's a piece about, you know, commemorating the genocide that happened in 1988 in Halabja, Iraq, during the Iran-Iraq war, um, by Saddam Hussein, but also with the support of many Western countries, including United States, UK, Germany, and many other countries. Um, you know, re reading the text is a very dry text, and looking at the image is something that is unbearable. It's, um, you know, you can't... Uh, just digest them. So it's about um, how to retell the story in a way that um, you 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 kind of like break the text in a way that it's I don't know maybe poetic um, and it's separated from its context. So you you kind of like have a different rhythm and and a narrative into viewers' ears, but also how to use you know imagery and documentation and appropriate them so they become digestible how to reenact them maybe using you know um, a performer's body a dancer's body to talk about pain to to kind of like translate which is you know at the end of the day a pure failure because it's impossible to talk about that it's impossible to reenact that it's just a gesture to kind of like include a narrative into a larger narrative um, so, you know, there is a lot of reference to, to what is being said, and there's a lot of kind of like process on my side to un understand that language and also um, react to my reactions reading them as someone who is coming from the region and always had a different relationship to the imagery of war, you know, growing up in Iran. Um, during, you know, being born in the middle of the Iran-Iraq war, being consuming images of war all my life through national media, in the public space, you know, the conversation of war is so present in that context. The, the discussion around war, the fear of war, the trauma of war is really present. We carry that. Even if we didn't experience it firsthand, we carry that in our body, in our everyday life. And then coming to the United States, I realized that there is a pure absence. You know, there's an absence of a narrative from Iraqi refugee. There's an absence of a narrative from um, uh, Syrian, of Afghans and their history is intertwined with, with the United States history, but are they actually represented in the history books? Are they actually part of the curriculum of the schools? And there is, there is the erasure of that completely from our narrative. So in a sense, you know, it's an observation of everything that I'm understanding, living in the United States and understanding, and also struggling uh, how I can intervene in that format of a narrative and bring in another narrative into the conversation. Thank you for that. And uh, you actually just um, gave us a good uh, transition into the next question. And it's something that both of you had mentioned is one is taking and synthesizing these different narratives that you have around you, but presenting it in a different way. And uh, both of you actually mentioned and uh, just even recently the idea of erasure. And I remember we were talking about the idea of erasure in both of your works, and also specifically about the effect of erasure and the process of it as you're making, as in the gesture you're making as uh, the person making the art. We talked about the idea of the amount of pressure, the kind of rhythm, but also the uh, the effects of it, you know, with a far day of the idea of uh, removing the face from uh, uh, the monument, um, also impending removing the bodies. But Yana, uh, you mentioned something about erasing to remember. Um, so could you uh, talk a little bit more about those details that you include in your work, uh, specifically about erasures? Yeah, like um, 
with the video erasure, especially like uh, animation, uh, animated film is a great uh, example for that. So the process of how that was done is on a single piece of paper where uh, you draw a frame, take a photo, erase it, then again. So uh, there is like, the result is this uh, one piece uh, of paper actually for at the end for this particular film that are containers of the story. So they are like filled with these erased traces that don't exist anymore, but they are uh, integral to presence of the story. So talking about absence, talking about um, talking about pres present information uh, and absent of some that should be equally uh, present is saying, speaking to that in a sense of like where a uh, past frame, even though erased, needs to be there in order to understand the, the movement that will take place. Uh, so in that, in that sense, so that is um, when we speak about uh, uh, animating, but also throughout drawing is, kind of, um, it's speaking to uh, non-existence of a singular truth and something that it's um, constantly as it shows up. So while I'm drawing spaces like architecture, um, it's, for example, this, this space where I'm right now in Krichago where I completely changed. Uh, like uh, buildings are um, kind of uh, removed and uh, malls showed up. So you would not recognize the space. And in that sense, like talking about, you know, history presenting like the certain space, uh, it's important to include what, what were the layers prior to that. So when I'm, when I'm trying to present uh, places that I'm living, I'm kind of observing them from different perspectives and going back to, to them again. So drawing and then erasing then coming back like several maybe months and then seeing again, what is my understanding of that and what maybe didn't enter in a, in a previous um, uh, expression. So that's the, that's it. <laughs> Um, I guess in my practice, erasure is something that happens in the process. So my first reaction looking at the images is either tracing over them or either collaging them, cutting, pasting, combining them to understand how I can deal with this imagery and how I can, and also a form of digestion and a mourning process for me. Um, it's, it's, and then, you know, it's also like, again, looking at the, the, how it's being presented out there and kind of like thinking of my medium as as a translation as as an imitation of what is already out there so for example in this in the case of pending erasing the bodies um i don't see my erasure anything separate from the language that the media is using you know and in that process of erasure you know i'm intentionally leaving traces of my clone stamp on the surface because I'm not, you know, my goal is not to erase them perfectly, but my goal is to show that there is something here that you're not seeing. Um, and also like, you know, in other past projects, you know, there is that tracing that happens as the first layer of digestion and, and kind of like internalizing that, that imagery and that pain. And then a layer later is kind of like carving into linocut to make a linocut print. That is another layer of a censorship, another layer of removing details to the point that, you know, um, uh, you know, it's, it's about how much your body actually interacts, the, the fluidity of your body interacting with the linocut and how much of it you're able to kind of cut in and how much of it is not able to be transformed. And I'm looking at kind of like engraving as a, form of you know retelling a story on top of the story that is already out there and kind of like establishing a censored narrative of a narrative that is maybe too harsh to be to to be acknowledged um so yeah i mean in each piece or in the photo transfer projects that 
I haven't shown them, but you know, it's a process of photo transferring an image on another surface that we talked about. It's the pressure, the performance of the body. If I put too much pressure on the in the process of removing the surface, I erase the image. And if I don't put enough pressure, I can't reveal the image. So how much that's also again another layer of how much am I showing and how much am I hiding, how much am I erasing, and how much am I communicating? Um, and also the erasure is also a reference to how much do we know, you know, uh, depending on um, our relationship to these images, you can kind of like bring in your imagination and your collective memory into the parts that are, you know, erased from the surface. So there's that um, openness, there's that trust, uh, trusting the audience with their collective memory to kind of like fill, in, fill it in uh, with their imagery. That's a, thank you for that. And it's wonderful that both of you, in speaking about the process of erasure, you actually answered the, one of the questions I was going to ask, but you touched on the idea of, you know, collective memory, preservation of histories, but also the healing and selective process, you know, choosing whether or not to take part in those memories or to step away those memories or to be immersed in it. But also both of you talked about the idea of emotions, you know, the aftermath of what happens during, um, what happens at an event and the afterwards uh, the effect of that and also empathy and the responses after seeing and experiencing your works especially being immersed in those spaces and i think one of the things that um you two also talked about is the idea of um you know the different layering of processes and methods so i want to ask you something about um the use of varied media and specifically about projections because i know um we had a conversation yesterday about your use of projections and how you um both of you approach in a different way and you try to get a, a different and specific effect of projections in your work. So if you can share something about that. Um, yeah, so um, the usage uh, of projections in my work is uh, kind of, I see it as, a, as a, some sort of distortion, like something, something that it's bringing um, another, you know, like what Faraday said uh, about trust, and like uh, how you are filling up the, the imagery that is given. Uh, like, so, so it's kind of feeling the, 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 draw, the still drawing is an aftermath, like something that we uh, see that it's pulled out from the context. And then projected imagery, it's kind of uh, filling up the, that, that, that space. And um, it's, our, like, it's more em em my emotional response uh, to the event that was presented on the drawing, that maybe it's that emotion is lacking once uh, the projected imagery is removed from it. But it's also like creating this. Um, I'm I'm trying to to create uh, this mesmerizing moment to capture the the focus and actually to pull the observer into the, the, the space and in some kind of like this dreamlike space where uh, that it's open um, for, for the observer to, to fill with his own emotion and the story. Um, and the timing is really important like because um, for uh, my, my projections, they are, um, they are or projected light or animated imagery. Uh, timing is crucial in a sense where I'm also playing with this um, interconnection between the movement and stillness. And in a sense, how much, um, what is the least amount of movement that can uh, allow us to, um, to understand that still imagery is just a bit in motion. Uh, and when it comes to animation, that's really like uh, was hard for me to kind of achieve that it's not um, building up of an imagery, but it's just like a, this uh, tiny amount of uh, information that is helping you to kind of embrace the emotion that aftermath of the event presented uh, left in uh, the sum of those erased traces. Uh, and um, and it's like um, <coughs> this way we live the story for whatever that story is, and, and the reminder to um, 
reminder to kind of stay focused and and listen to what uh, the image you're trying to communicate. So in that sense was, uh, especially with animated Oh, sorry, Anna. Um, storyboards about can, what? Can you hear me? You're breaking breaking up slightly. Now? Now you're good. Yeah. So with uh, with the with the work uh, neither here nor there that had like these uh, series of uh, animated lights projected onto the drawings, um, it was a really important part of the process was to actually time these spaces to kind of communicate in some kind of collaborative spirit. So in that way, um, timing plays another uh, sort of role. And, um, and, it's, uh, and, and also to uh, keep the observer kind of engaged and like not stay just with the uh, movement that is related to one part of the piece, but actually have it sit still just enough to catch that something else is also maybe happening that it's um that it's informing the the actual like the whole image all right thank you yana and i think that goes into um uh, finally what I, I have i have i imagine you're going to talk about the movement and projection as well so pass it to you um i was thinking actually i mean i can talk about the the medium and then talk about projection but i want to show some images about the projection so i don't be so abstract since i didn't show that work <laughs> um but choosing i mean i work with many different medium and i don't really think about the medium until maybe that it's some of the last steps that i figure figure that out and um I, I don't know, it kind of comes to me after reading about my subject matter and doing some research on it. So as I'm reading and as I'm looking, I'm kind of like observing and analyzing the languages, the, the imagery and thinking about the imitation of that language, the imitation of that format of the presentation. And I'm sketching and I'm also looking at a lot of artists work as, as I'm doing to understand how they do that or how are they playing with the medium, um, with different material. I was a photographer. I was never trained to be, you know, a sculptor or in, make installation. So it's a learning process for me to understand different mediums and also experiment with them and experiment with material and see how they behave and how they react and how they connect with each other. Um, so uh, I guess I can share this work and talk about projection specifically on this piece. Um, it's an installation that, um, oh wow, of course it's not gonna show it. Uh, <laughs> actually maybe I can stop sharing and, Sorry, I can go to my website and share that image. Then we wouldn't have loading problems. <laughs> um, Is it the image from you that you're looking for? I'm looking. Um, are you seeing okay, this screen? Yes. Okay, so this is maybe one of the main projection experimentations that I did. And this is also a piece about Halapcha 1988. It was a three year, four year project that I was hoping to make kind of like a monument for that massacre, for that genocide as a way to remember um, uh, that moment. So it's, it was commissioned and it was placed at the shed. And one of the main questions that I was asking myself was what does it mean to talk about this subject in, in a cultural institution um, in, the, in, in New York? You know, what does, what, what does this juxtaposition mean? So I thought about um, the, my materials and projection in relation to this space. And I used PDLC as a surface to project these images on it because um, PDLC has this potential to go opaque and transparent. So I kind of like curated the piece in a way that in certain moments, the image goes, the, the surface goes transparent and therefore you lose um, your visuals, you lose the projection. And that's a way for me to kind of like remind the audience of the context that you're, you're, you're 
in, in a gallery space and you're looking at the artwork. Uh, and I thought that it's important to kind of like criticize myself while I'm talking about the subject um, and bring that context into the forefront as a way of, you know, as, as a format of communication and kind of like giving it a context. Um, so, you know, this is maybe, I guess, like one of my main experimentations with projection and understanding its presence and its meaning in the, in the work um, in relation, you know, which made sense with the piece. So, yeah, I don't know if I answered the question or not or rambled, but yeah. Oh, you did. Thank you. And it's amazing. Yeah, I, uh, ahead, I, yeah. I, I, I forgot to add, like, uh, when it comes to various medias, I focused on, on, on projections, but it's, I think it's important to, to say it because it really influenced what I mentioned, uh, uh, collaboration uh, with uh, performers, puppeteers, like this experience from a theater and you know, the experience from being on a stage under the, the stage lights and seeing yourself as somebody who is activating um, spaces on, st on stage, but also being controlled by light where if you are not in the light, you are out of time and some kind of like not part of the sequence. So that also that also really informed how um, how parts of the story within the drawing are illuminated. Um, so that's something that I forgot to to add. Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, there's so many connections before uh, between your works, even though you work in different subject matters, you work in a variety of media, and uh, <clears throat> even the narratives uh, are different, but you, in, in a way, through your work, you show your relationship to space, you show your relationship and your um, dedication to showing invisibility or visibility, being transparent, being opaque, and also questioning the spaces around you and responding to that. Um, another thing I want to ask, and uh, Jan, I'm glad that you mentioned um, uh, the work that you did um, with Yana, who's also here with, uh, with the fabrics in the space. The next question I want to ask before we go into the big, uh, big group Q&A, so everyone that's a cue to have your questions ready, is um, I know that collaboration has been a big part of both of your processes, and um, you've gone to so many different um, you know a lot of people within the arts, you've collaborated uh, many different times, you're always uh, supporting so many people's works. During this uh, current moment, uh, this pandemic, how has, how has this pandemic uh, affected your collaborative process and how have you adjusted to it? I, I guess I'll go this <laughs> um, Collaboration, I think the idea of the collaboration for me started by the idea of displacement. You know, I grew up in a family with many sisters that I had as my support and I had my sister as always, you know, helping me out with my projects, always like in, a, in the most uh, generous way possible. And then all of a sudden finding myself in a different country and not having that support system. And thinking about, you know, from the beginning, thinking about how I can maintain that connection, which was, which has always been part of my practice, working with my older sister, Ashraf, to kind of like document, videograph, um, take photographs, you know, or to find something for me from the market in Iran and then send it to me. And then working with Sepide to fabricate a sculpture for me, just like giving her ideas, this is what I want, um, which was the top end. And then you know, she bringing in her opinions and then making something and, you know, for the pedestal working with Muhammad to build, you know, it's like always present or working with Sadat to using his photographs or even, you know, um, working with found images. And I think it's important to kind of like talk about appropriation and talk about who did what in that process and build on top of that. That's why I value, you know, when I'm appropriating images from news, I want to acknowledge that this image was taken by this person at this place and it's not mine. So that intervention and that appropriation should be, the labor should be visible in the process, I think. Um, during the pandemic, I think I've been working with Heckler since 2018 and that's been, it has been an amazing experience. I think that's the place that I find context for who I am and my practice. And um, <clears throat> pandemic has been challenging, but also at the same time as an adjunct teacher who is like commuting in the five boroughs, going to different neighborhoods and teaching and also working with youth education at BRIC, at COP. 
um, I was literally traveling in five boroughs and spending a lot of time, you know, commuting. So pandemic gave me time actually to, to, I mean, aside from all the stress and all the, all the things that's been happening around the world, it gave me time to basically sit down, reflect, read, study, and collaborate more with Heckler that, you know, kind of, um, we, we experimented with online assemblies that was amazing because we had participants from around the world. So in a sense, Zoom gave us a more international platform to be in conversation with people who we are not usually in a conversation with. Um, one of the fascinating moments for me was, you know, talking about public space. And for me, living in the U.S., living in New York, I was so focused on being in this city that when I when we talked about public space, it, it took us two hours to define public space because people are coming from, you know, all these different contexts. So let's just define that in all these different cities that you're coming in. Um, so, you know, in a sense, and also like, I guess in the pandemic, my priority was not making, I was questioning um, the use of objects, use of material. Uh, I was, uh, you know, I was at the phase that I was like, does it even mean anything to make something when we are experiencing such a such a thing that is larger than all of us? And what does it mean to reflect on that? What does it mean to understand how the city is functioning during that time? Um, so I guess I was spending most of my 20th year of 2020 um, understanding my environment, understanding rent a strike, understanding, you know, internet equity, understanding the digital divide that is happening, understanding um, racism and understanding how to, you know, navigate in the system that is based on white supremacy and how to learn from, you know, black leaders during the BLM movement. So even though I didn't focus in the studio practice, I think it was a year of learning and reflecting and collaborating with Heckler and, you know, figuring out other ways of, um, being an artist and being in a studio and making things. Thank you. I like. I love how you mentioned this. You know, t taking what is what we're going through and taking it as your re reflection. So thank you for that, Diana. Yeah. So I mean, Farid, Farid has said so much. Like it's uh, for me, collaboration uh, was really insightful when it comes to my own practice and like. Um, I don't know. It was just, it's just like really important to to say that um, artists. I don't know. It's easy to say that you did something on your own, but actually, in reality, like any kind of ambitious or whatever project that you that I wanted to execute, it was never done by myself. So it was done by a group of people, and like it doesn't matter is that like your father and a neighbor neighbor building a metal construction or not, or it's like somebody that is you know has a, a name or whatever is there. So you cannot you know what what she said like erasing the like having that uh, invisibility of labor. I think it's really um, problematic and and present. And when it comes to collaborations, they are imposing kind of that that's not the reality that that the that the work is done by several people who kind of equally engaged or engaged in their in in their capacities so what i find like really really uh, important um, that i learned from working with different people is understanding the the capacities my own capacities capacities of people that i'm working with and so uh, when like starting with the heckler in 2000 since 2018 it was amazing experience to work with so many people and to be introduced to so many different practices and learn so much um from learn about uh, organizing and logistics like what does it take to uh do something with uh bigger like amount of people uh, and and also um, it's when it comes to studio practice, I can say that some of the uh, most challenging uh, insights were supported by people who were coming from a different um, kind of uh, how you say um, different uh, group like of, of knowledge. 
And that, that was really exciting to learn, you know, to learn, to work with others, like to um, kind of, um, yeah, just uh, learn more. And my first collaboration was with my sister, like Natasha, it was a long distance collaboration and it started, you know, with that story, she invited me to, to do the story with her. Like she invited me, like she sent me the story that I had to respond to and then, um, the works got created. She created her own version of a story. I created my own and you know, both go both grew in their directions. So it's, um, I don't know, I, I find it really powerful and important that it's there. And for me right now, like when it comes to pandemic, uh, I am living the ultimate collaboration and it's a collaboration with the family, uh, which means to, you know, uh, go to the countryside and kind of, get uh, reintroduced to like family dynamics and actually learn how to work with things that you maybe don't like but it's there and it's you know or and things that you are uh, discovering again as awesome so it's um and that's yeah i i, I find it really cool and uh, and important for um any artistic practice at least to try, if, if not have it as some kind of continuous uh, portion of your expression. Yeah, thank you for that. You know, sharing about the idea of capacity is your own personal capacity, but the um, also yeah, the and also working in different spaces. Yeah, and it's also like I, I started uh, when it comes to countryside working with a uh, one more like collective, the other collective, and it's like a group of architects. And that's really interesting experience to jump into uh, some completely different sphere and see how, how that will go. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you. And good luck. I mean, it sounds like it. all this is leading to future projects. And uh, the two of you from, from since I've known you seems to never stop working. So it's always, um, you know, it's always inspiring to see what you're doing next and what you're doing, uh, especially with the limitations that we're given now. So I'm going to turn to some questions. Uh, there were a couple that were posted in the chat. I'm not sure if uh, Cosmo is still here. Um, if you are, maybe not. But Cosmo, basically, I think he wanted to ask uh, Faraday. Um, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on the toppled monument ar archive, if you've heard about it. No, I'm actually grateful that he shared that website. I just opened it and I looked at it. Um, it's a collection of uh, monuments that's been toppled in the United States in the 2020. And I think it's really important to preserve, um, you know, that story and put them in the context. And it's actually pretty amazing to see that that archive is there and thinking about what is next, you know, what is after these moments and yeah. That, that's that's awesome that you shared that. Yeah, I'm gonna take a look at it too. So thank you. So just so you know, I put it in the chat, the Top of Monument Archive. And Tatiana, if you're here, did you wanna mention something about sisterhood and um, uh, how it reminds you of Hedgehog in the Fog by Yuri Norstein? Oh, cool. Uh, really, awesome. Oh, hold on. Um, yeah, I think that, um, hi. <laughs> Hi, Elena. It was nice to hear you, and I'm really grateful for this conversation. And uh, yeah, I, um, for some reason, I got a flashback when you were showing your uh, art, uh, your technique, and it's very, very um, well-known Russian um, cartoonist and a very talented artist who made that uh, cartoon. I, I mm -hmm. ask everyone to see it. It's very like atmospheric. And uh, uh, I saw your um, animation and it kind of reminded me that um, you kind of work on the same kind of theme of some kind of memory, a childhood, uh, dreams, something like that. Can you um, do you yourself see some kind of like uh, interactions between have you ever seen that cartoon that I'm talking about yeah I think I am yeah it's uh it's like really um uh, okay, yeah continue. it's yeah. very very old cartoon and um it's uh 
it's a legend in uh, Soviet culture and the post-Soviet countries. And uh, mm -hmm. I just uh, caught myself on the flashbacks of like this feeling of coziness and at the same time, some kind of like a little bit of blues and um, some kind of like childhood dreams, memories what you were thinking about when you were making that piece because sisterhood is a very important uh, part uh, and theme for me because I have a younger sister as well and her name is Natasha too. <laughs> uh, so um, I was just uh, asking you what what you, you were thinking about when you were making that uh, incredible piece. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Well, yeah, it's uh, the, the the film is definitely uh, a response to uh, a departure of something that you see as anchor, like to something that um, like it was uh, it was the, the, when the story is written. Uh, as I said, Natasha went to uh, United States, and for me that was like a drastic change because we are um, connected and. Uh, and when she sent me the story, it was really emotional and uh, it was on a theme of play and uh, it included uh, the house and four waters. And so, so, so it's, and I responded to that story by going there, going to that house, the old house in our countryside that still exists there. So nothing there is kind of invented. What is imaginative is the emotional response to it but it's actually pretty factual so it kind of things uh, switch there like what is seen as factual and what is actually imagined so it's um and i went there and i responded from the the present to what she was saying uh and it it ended up being this dialogue um that and we also then uh, recorded videos, me from my space, then she from Detroit, Detroit uh, actually uh, Ann Arbor where she was at that time and created an installation calling her House of Four Waters, the introduction. And from there, she later on um, developed the piece, The House of Four Waters, which is the name of her kind of story. For me, it was sisterhood. And I think that this replies to your question in a sense of like, when we think about certain place, space and a memory to it, how we define ourselves towards that memory. Like what are we extrapolating as an essence that we are basing our story about it. So it was, um, for me, it was the connection like uh, between us and, and that. And it was like, um, um, you guys freezed. I don't know if my internet is stable or not. No. You're back on again. We missed you for a few seconds. Yeah, okay. So, uh, and it was it was that response on like, what does it mean, you know, to have stability? And uh, if we talk about home, uh, these four waters, this kind of like stability in a, in a sense, having four corners, yes, the three are the, the least amount of anchors that are needed for stability, but with four, like it, for me, it was a presentation of like, uh, our family kind of unit and but then again talking about inner home like an inner stability and what is needed for that um, so it's I was thinking about all these things and and then also like solidarity between women as like really really important thing that helps you to kind of uh, get out of the imposed perspective that in Serbia is quite patriarchal and um, look at things from this other angle and allow yourself to, um, to live that other angle. So without having uh, like support through life, I mean, from on my family, but most importantly, my sister who was there to constantly like put maybe that other perspective or something was, was definitely, um, yeah, I just wanted to make a note to that. And that's why it's sisterhood because it's, um, I see that as some sort of um, that connection is something that helps you to 
survive but in that sense of like what are like uh, women you know um like values and different uh angles of like seeing you know the world and uh yeah how to help that live and that support and collaboration that we talked about prior to your question is, is it becomes like essential yeah, thank you for an answer. Uh, I completely agree with you about like uh, semantics of the word sisterhood, that it's something more than just uh, relations inside of the family. It's uh, more than that. And I, I can definitely relate to that. Thank you for an answer. Yeah, cool. Uh, thank you, Anna. And, thank and then you, that Anna. also speaks to kind of uh, what? Yeah, then can you <laughs> I, I, I again praise uh, uh, her yeah. values and having like this feminist space where you just uh froze so we can't hear you. Yeah. Are you, are okay. you back? And now you can hear. Okay. Now we can hear. Yeah. You. So and also like with Heckler ha having it as you know like a feminist space where it's open for you know other safe space for other voices to 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 echo. All right. Thank you for that. Um, is, does anyone have any other questions? You can type it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask. Okay, Megan, did you want to ask the question uh, out loud or would you like me to ask it? Hi, um, yeah, I was just very interested um, in uh, the use of graphite in the animations of your work. Um, I don't know, I know that animation is like the, ba like the basis of that is using drawing but I thought it was very interesting how you expanded that idea with like using graphite. And I was just very interested in like your purpose of using graphite in your work like that. Cool. Thank you for, for the question. Yeah, I actually discovered, um, I started uh, doing uh, large scale uh, drawings once I discovered graphite powder that was something that allowed me to almost like perform while drawing uh, because that's the way how I'm making these um, uh, bigger surfaces of uh, graphite surfaces. I'm using hands so there is a lot of like touch to it. It's not like a separate manipulation like when you are using pencil. So it's some kind of like painting with a drawing technique. So graphite really allows me to be, you know, equally like precise and detail, but then uh is, is diminish like remove the detail uh and cover it up with a uh, something that it's uh like a bigger surface um of material and the the and and then it's also with graphite that it's dust so it's kind of really vulnerable and uh easy to like e erase or change and transform. And I think that speaks to the way we kind of carry our stories and the way we uh, listen to the stories that are told to us. Uh, it's kind of like they are super fragile and they can transform and shift very easily depending on the environment where we are uh, like hearing them and uh, people we are trying to, you know, share them that can influence influence them. So in that sense, it's really um, interesting how uh, graphite uh, equally can be like this dense surface that seems like non erasable at all, completely because um, trace is always present. But on the other hand it's fragile. So this juxtaposition of these two sides of material is some something that I see with 
especially because it's pre present uh, in everyday kind of life and the way we experience stories around us. Thank you so much. That was really insightful and I really like that. That's very cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have a, I have a question for uh, Farideh. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Farideh, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, polyvocal aspect in your practice and how actually you transitioned from kind of bringing collective uh, through uh, yes, through collaboration, but also through um, collective, um, through bringing in collectivity visually within your work um, and how that transitioned into actually bringing um, different, like directly different voices um, into, uh, into your like narrative construction. Um, for example, with Halabja and um, as well as with like um, collaborating with a theater group um, and the aspect of voice and movement, uh, because a lot of uh, a lot um, a lot of work that you shared um, was focusing on kind of like use of medium, uh, where there was some some form of um, of detachment from uh, from the actual uh, event. But then, when working with body and with voice, um, your practice really went into um, into uh, like a next dimension. And within that context, also the uh, collaboration um, with the People's Tribune, all that I think for most of us collaborating um, within that context was uh, um, was uh, kind of like both challenging but also very kind of like empowering um, way to enter a new way, new new form of working. Um, that's a great question. That's something that I guess I'm learning a lot in the process, and I never have the answer to it. Um, I think from the early time that I did practice, that I practiced art back in Iran with a project, um, workers are taking photographs, you know, that I collaborated with my sister and asking her to kind of like take part in the whole process and also like thinking process, development process of the project. Um, it's a scary, but also it, it's about trust and it's about putting your ego aside and trusting what comes in into your practice, especially when it's a long distance, you know, communication and working. And I, I love the excitement. And also for me, it's a way of learning something that I don't know how to do and um, basically getting into the environments that kind of like maybe... Um, freaks me out to enter otherwise, you know, thinking about um, working with bronze. I would never, you know, I, I don't know how to work with bronze. I don't even know how to cast something. I never cast anything in my life, but I wanted to work with bronze. So um, if, if I have, you know, my sister who is an sculptor and knows how to cast, and I trust her with her visual, you know, intervention into my practice, um, that's very gifting and also it's a way to kind of like put myself in a vulnerable situation of you know I haven't seen the piece you're making it and you're going to send it to me from Iran you know um so I'm going to see the final product two weeks before the show and I just have to trust you throughout the process and trust the images that you're sending me um and also like walk me through the process of fabricating that and casting that which is beautiful you know this long distance um communication that is happening the same with acquired from the above by the president owner that I have this idea but I can't go back to Iran you know how can I collaborate with people who are back back home and build something and make something so again you know with Ashi with my sisters I guess they've been part of my practice they know my my aesthetic they know and I'm constantly in a conversation with them so again that's the that's the trust and also like kind of like going on the side and being you know what what the flow and what the process will bring for me and how I can work with those material. Um, I think, you know, Halapcha was one of the, um, one of the most um, kind of like curated um, collaborations that I had. That being said, also it was full of surprises and challenges. Um, I'm, I think, you know, again, throughout the process, making collages on the topic and figuring out, you know, extracting text from the, from the uh, research that I did, at some point I realized performance is the only way that I can, you know, 
talk about this this incident, talk about this massacre. And again, I'm not a performer. I don't even know how to dance. I'm basically a clown on this stage, you know, dancing freely when it comes to movement. Um, but I wanted to work with a dancer and I talked to a few dancers to, and I looked at a lot of dance, you know, I was I, thinking about a body that doesn't know how to move and doesn't know the, the, the language of, you know, performance, but looking, um, you know, I found myself completely illiterate, looking at the movements, looking at other dances. And I'm like, if I'm, trying to communicate that with a performer and I don't even know what is the language that they use in the studio to talk about movement how can I communicate with her so I started looking at performances and just taking screenshots of the moments that I thought can resemble what I'm looking for and then bringing that to the studio to the rehearsal room and be like hey this is what I'm thinking about this is the narrative and this is what I want to happen here can you show me how to do that <laughs> and learning a lot in that process and also trusting and um you know in that process a lot of times I, I i always think that if i i did the performance with isabel umali who is an amazing dancer and choreographer and if i did that with any other dancer that would be a completely different piece because the way that she interpreted and the way that she translated those texts into movement is unique to her and unique to her body and her understanding of trauma and pain um which was a beautiful experience and also you know a lot of challenges and when it came to the music i worked with sadra and the advantage of working with sadra shahab is that we are in a constant conversation he knew about my project from day one so i was constantly talking to him we talked about sound we talked about he came from the same experience you know growing up in the war in iran and coming here and kind of like growing up with the same imagery so it was easy to kind of not easy i mean Easy is not really the word for it, but it was a constant conversation of understanding the role of sound, understanding the instrument that we are using, and a lot of back and forth, a lot of you know conversations. What does this instrument like? What does this sound make you feel? What does it mean to use trumpets, you know, in in context to chemical weapon that kind of like um, has this effect on breathing and the collapse of the lung system. So how can we translate that into an instrument and bring that into the work? What does it mean to sound, to use the sound of this melancholic piano, you know, that is like the moments of tabbing on the on the key and, you know, making that emit that kind of like um, the bang or the sound that stops you. Um, what does it mean to bring in breathing? You know, there were like a lot of conversation, a lot of, um, back and forth of understanding the the narrative and understanding the medium in relation to that um, and working with the cinematographers also again I have a vision we practically rehearsed something but what does it mean to translate a live performance into a video um, which is again you know another challenging process that you know can possibly take away a lot from the performance but trusting and conversations and you know hours of talking and talking and talking to understand where I'm coming from and where they are coming from and having two cinematographers with two different visions that for the first time they come to this space again I think that's a trust and also talks a lot about me being an artist who is not financially supported so I'm you know I have this budget this is the time that we're working and their generosity in giving their time their expertise their talent and contributing to the piece as if this is their piece so I'm really grateful because I've, I've been lucky I've been working with people who put a lot have been putting a lot in the in the work that I've been sharing with them and I think the tribunal um a collaboration that we did, uh, I did with Natasha, Shimridli, Dina Al Adib, and we had a large group of um, people who joined us and they actually responded to this project was a combination of curation, organizing, um, discussions and conversations and also a level of trust to the day that we went. I mean, we had some ideas of how people are gonna respond to these um, 28 exhibits but we didn't know exactly what's going to happen. So we were all entering the space, trusting them with their narratives and their reactions and, you know, their, their arguments that they're bringing into the space. And it's, uh, it's always, you know, I think it's always beautiful. You know, it's always gifting when you enter the space and you're like, it's not me, it's us that we are experiencing something together. And, um, 
the more I do it, the more I realize that, I don't know, working in solitude can be boring, <laughs> you know, and working in collaboration with other people can be really gifting and challenging. And also you have to constantly put yourself, you know, go to the, think about, how, you know, the language, the process, communication, and how much, and listening, you know, the practice of listening in that process is also something that I guess maybe I didn't know how to do at the beginning. A, a lot of my earlier collaborators told me that you're a dictator in working and you want it to be this way, you know, and along the process, you learn that maybe it's not about, you know, how I want it. It's about listening and understanding how other people are seeing at the same thing, you know, looking at the same thing and what are this thing that they're bringing in and putting all of them in a pot <laughs> and mixing it and taking it out. What is the result of that? Um, it's, I, I'm enjoying it a lot. It's scary always, uh, it's challenging always, but also um, pretty awesome. <laughs> That's amazing hearing uh, the multiple of voices uh, in your work, but also the level of trust, like you mentioned so many times that it's your work, but you are turning the people to collaborate. So it's a, it's a full community uh, working on just one project and one vision. And it's also their trust, you know, them trusting me. It's not just me trusting them. It's a mutual, you know, safe space that we just share ideas and we come up with conclusions. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you for that. Um, looks like we may have time for one or two more short questions if anyone has any. If no one has a question, does anyone have a question? Go for it. Um, I guess it's not necessarily a question. First, thank you so much. This was um, really heartwarming and just beautiful. And, you know, I know both of you uh, to some level, but this was just, um, I feel like a, a whole different level of intimacy and just uh, depth to that. Uh, the conversation that um, I'm honored to be a part of. Uh, so thanks for sharing, it was really beautiful. Thanks, Francis. Thanks, Farida, Helena, and everyone else involved. Um, there's so much to say. I think a lot of things have been said, so I don't want to repeat it, but I think, you know, I'll take this opportunity since no one's having a question and I want to just invite you, Farida, Helena, Natasha, and others that I've been in conversation with and new folks who I haven't been in conversation with to take this conversation outside of this, uh, you know, and. I'm really specifically interested in the concept of scale in both of your works that was talked about. So I'm not going to repeat a lot of those things. I'm just going to highlight some of the things I heard, the scale and the issue of monuments and monumentality. And I'd like to propose taking this conversation, um, you know, to a workshop, maybe if anyone's interested in this um, and, and, and think about, um, you know, some of the projects that were brought up one of them was the monument lab the other one was the archive project and looking at these sites whether in there in the us uh, and elsewhere that were toppled or um, or created as a response to fascism or dictatorship and looking at your works as a form of uh, 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 of an intervention into those public spaces so how would you take your work um, to those public spaces and and either create these create new projects or you know maybe a collaboration between the two of you or the three of us or multiple people where we identify these sites that you've identified right or, or that they actually don't even exist right so and let's let me be more specific so in the in the in the context of um, you know the US uh, you know there's many monuments on a daily basis that are being toppled right um, um, and and so and there's many projects right now that are happening around what do you how do you what do you replace in them so one of the most beautiful ones I saw and there's many of those I mean there's you know the one in London I can't remember the, the exact location right now but the one I remember very much because I was living in San Francisco at the time was the one of Christopher Columbus um, at the at, uh, at what is it called the tower uh, I forget the name of the tower uh, Hoy Tower um, and it's facing Alcatraz, right? And Alcatraz, for most of you are familiar with it, but if, if you're not for some reason, Alcatraz was a site of resistance for many, many years by indigenous folks trying to reclaim it. Anyways, without getting into all that history, Christopher Columbus's statue was facing Alcatraz. And uh, last year, the, the, uh, the statue was removed, uh, which was an incredible gesture. And there's many conversations about how to replace it, right? And there's many community and, and um, members and artists who are trying to produce 
works that might replace that. And then, but of course, there's a pushback. Anyways, without getting too much into it, so basically in the U.S., those kind of money, instead of being toppled, what kind of uh, stories are being told, uh, both kind of narrative-wise, but really like physically, you know, how do you replace a monument like that? So an intervention would be, we've talked about this outside in our conversations with Heckler about how, what kind of collaborations can be made to replace those sites. So that's one thing. And then in places like, um, you know, in Serbia, where there was actually an effort to some degree to produce work that was going to uh, speak to fascism, right? Um, but then other narratives have been erased. So, you know, what, would, would it be a new a new monument or would it be an intervention to those monuments? Um, and for, for, for me specifically, what I'm interested in is in some of the work that Farida is engaging with very beautifully is, for example, the narratives, uh, these narratives that you speak about, Farida, that need to be uh, put into public space. So for example, a monument commemorating uh, the ongoing war and death and destruction that was uh, instigated by a, you know, a fascist response to September 11th. So the war in Afghanistan, there's no memorial that commemorates you know, the, the deaths of thousands of uh, Afghans, right? Um, or Iraqis or uh, uh, you know, uh, Yemenis, all these wars that you're speaking about that are happening, that are led by you know, US, US imperial interests and militarization around the world um, are causing havoc, not only obviously in those countries, but having a site, you know, a kind of a, a cyclical back, right? The, the, without getting too much into it. So basically the point is like, how do you create these monuments that are phys in physical space confronting this, 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 these, these populations that are aware or unaware um, of those realized. Anyways, I don't wanna get too much into it. I think we're all on the same page. A lot of us are having this conversation thinking about it, but I'd like to just invite you all to like, you know, if you're interested, we can take it with, you know, Heckler or outside of Heckler can talk about like, not just conceptually thinking through these things, but collaborations uh, that are about uh, bringing new works in public space, I think that would be interesting because the issue of scale come really beautifully in both of your works, and um, uh, you know, I I would love to help support uh, bringing it to public space. Anyways, I can go on, but this is just I'm just thinking out loud, and since no one had a question, I just thought of reflecting something back. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the beautiful work. That's amazing. Dina. Thank you. I, <clears throat> I've been actually thinking a lot about public space and public monument, and if there is a public monument that represents um, U.S. invasion and intervention in other countries, how does it look like? And I have ideas, you know, that I would love to collaborate, but also, and this at the same time, I'm thinking about, you know, this idea of again, who gets to say what and who gets to have that platform to create those public spaces and what does it mean to create an alternative space in response to this um, kind of like systematic censorship of those voices. And um, this is something that I guess I started with Heckler, I kind of brought that to CODA, again, bringing, bringing it back to Heckler to understand how we can bring in the subject of public space into the conversation. and. Um, I mean, in response to that, I'm thinking about kind of a digital intervention as a solution because it gives us the freedom to imagine and intervene without actually having the physical presence in that. That's, um, I guess, I don't know, it's another project that I, I would love to collaborate and I would love to sit and brainstorm and discuss and see, but how, how is that possible and what are the ways around it? So thank you for bringing it up. And I think, yes, absolutely, let's do it. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that, Farida, and thank you for Dina for uh, for bringing that up. I know this is uh, the right uh, time for it, and especially going back into uh, the subject matter of uh, both of your works and yeah, the idea of collective memory. What memory is going to be passed on over time? What memory is going to, whose memories are going to be told over time? But also, how are those memories going to be shared, and in what spaces, and in what context? So, <clears throat> at this point. Um, uh, Natasha, do you want to see see if we can do one more question or, yeah, does anyone have, I think we have time for one last question, if anyone has one. Okay, if there's no questions, uh, Faraday or Yelena, just, we have, oh, sorry, go ahead, Dina. Sorry, no, I was going to say, just a response to Farida, check out uh, Monument Lab's new app that they just launched or launching. 
it's an art and technology platform designed to allow users to dig deeper into the living history of a particular city. Uh, so it's an app you download and then you, I don't know exactly, so it's a brand new thing, check it out. And it basically helps you un learn about the monuments in the city as you walk through. Um, uh, told and untold stories. Uh, so my point, I just want to say there are projects like this that are happening that are digital, but um, I think it's interesting to think about the digital in relationship to the, the physical still. So I just want to say, check that that project out and you know, I can share more other projects like that that are engaging with it both on a physical level and a digital, that's all. Monuments app, you said? Yeah, so it's Monument Lab, the, the, the you know, the Monument Lab, if you just check out Monument Lab's Instagram or whatever website, they just launched something called Overtime, and it's an app that you download. Um, uh, yeah, Overtime. It's an uh, you download the app, and they're doing um, they're doing collaboration, like a prototype of the tour with the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So they just launched it, and they're doing a prototype, and then they're hoping that this app can be downloaded by everybody. I don't know exactly how in the future they're trying to think of it, but it is an app, and uh, yeah, I'll have you yeah just check it out uh, on their website. Thank you. It sounds like the next project is uh, augmented reality. <laughs> <laughs> but um, on that note, I just want to say thank you so much, uh, Faraday and Young, uh, for sharing not just your insights, but you know your artwork, your references, your thoughts, your future projects, your past projects. I mean, this has been very, you know, we didn't get a chance, like I said, to see the exhibitions, but we got to see more than just the behind the scenes, and we got to know more about you and your process. So uh, I want to say thank you. And I'll pass it off to either one of you or Natasha. Mm, yeah, so um, I want to second what, what Francis said. Like, thank you, uh, Christian and Farida, for really beautiful, generous presentations. Francis, for uh, spectacular moderating <laughs> and hosting of, the, <laughs> of this gathering. Um, and uh, everyone who, um, who joined us, um, it is very, very heartwarming to see so many people staying for two hours with us and uh, sharing your thoughts, your comments, references as well. Um, so hi Rashmi. <laughs> um, so if you um, uh, wish to stay in touch, um, you can find, um, I'll, I'll share our, uh, our email address um, and uh, we've already in the uh, Eventbrite um, uh, linked it you know, you came here through, there are many links to the artist's website, also to Koda's website. Um, and uh, we will be using that mailing list to share this video recording with you once uh, once it's published, um, that you're welcome also to to spread around if you if you wish. Um, but yeah, I think that's, uh, that's it. Um, and as Dina uh, said, like work continues, collaborations continues, and, you know, feel free to to get in touch and uh, together we'll, um, we'll, you know, definitely continue kind of uh, developing and growing in directions that are uh, inspiring and meaningful to, to many of us, if not all of us. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. This yeah, really, this was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Take care.